tales for dark nights. Want to make sure you never miss a Chilling Tales for Dark Nights video again? Be sure to subscribe and hit that bell to turn on notifications. <laughs> Good evening. I'm storyteller Otis Gyre, and I ain't your grandfather. From where I'm from, we don't do bedtime stories. And if that's what you were expecting, you're in the wrong place. If it's terrifying tales you're after, well then, I've got just the thing. Get comfortable, settle in. Turn off the lights, if you dare. Your night is about to get a whole lot darker. <laughs> Who needs sleep anyway? <laughs> Good evening, you're listening to Scary Stories Told in the Dark. Welcome to Season 5, Episode 9. I'm your host, Otis Gyre. In tonight's episode, I'll be performing four stories for you about deals with devils, eerie elevators, malevolent morticians, and supernatural stalkers. You're listening to the standard edition of tonight's program, which contains the first two terrifying tales. If you'd like to show your support and enjoy an extended version of this and other episodes with twice the terror, visit simplyscarypodcast.com and click Patrons in the upper menu to sign up today. Thank you for your support. Now it's time to take a walk together down the moonlit trail. So lock your doors... Turn your lights down low and settle in. The show is about to begin. <laughs> Our first tale of terror this evening comes to us from author Rick Pyle. In it, we'll meet the members of the Alden family, who have some very strange traditions passed down through generations in order that they might avoid an even more terrible fate. Without further ado, I present to you The Crooked Room. Call me Bramwell Alden. I can't give you my real name because my prick of a family is too well known. My ancestor, William Alden, came over on the Mayflower. And my grand-aunt has been bragging about it since the day the boat landed on Plymouth goddamn rock. The old witch. My real last name screams Old New England Money, and my first name has the same snotty douche ring to it as Bramwell, so it'll do for the purposes of this pretentious tale. I'd been having the same dream for weeks before I returned to the family estate for the selection. I'm trapped in a white room and can't move. I try and try, but no matter how hard I struggle, I can't break free. I wake up, howling like a wolf in heat, bathed in a cold sweat. It's always the same dream, and it always ends with my hair-raising awakening. This time, however, when I finally calm down enough from my nightmare induced madness, I find myself in my old room at the main house rather than my fashionable New York City penthouse address. Shit! I haven't slept here since I was eighteen, seven long years ago. My sisters, brothers, and yours truly moved back to the Alden family compound after Dad had died in an accident at the docks. I'd been two years old at the time. 
A steel beam had fallen on his head from a high crane with slippery talons. In his defense, he was wearing his hard hat, but the eye beam gave no shits about that minor detail. My grandparents were granted custody of the Alden orphans, and I lived with them until my teenage escape. The room hadn't changed a bit. The pot smell had long gone away, but the same crappy goth posters still hung on the walls. A thick coating of dust lay everywhere. No doubt my doting grandparents had sealed off this particular embarrassment, even from the service staff. If you're a discerning reader, you've probably surmised that my relationship with my family is strained at best. On the other hand, you could say more accurately that it's completely fucked seven ways from Sunday at worst. I won't bore you with all the traumas and indignities of my childhood. Suffice it to say that I was born... Uh, a sensitive and highly intelligent boy to a mother who had tried to claw her own eyes out shortly before I was born. After my birth, the family decided that an exclusive and exorbitantly expensive psychiatric facility would be best placed uh, to deposit my mother. Thus, a troublesome daughter could be gotten out of the way and the sterling reputation of our esteemed family would be preserved. My stoic and cultured grandfather would have loved to have had a surgeon in the family, but do-it-yourself eye removal was most definitely not what he had in mind. The reason I left the family estate after high school was to escape the claustrophobic walls of my family prison. The reason I came back to this place of family bliss was for a much less noble reason. Money. As a young man of philosophical and artistic bent, I had decided that the drudgery of work just wasn't for me. Luckily for me, and for the world at large, in Alden, which I was, I was provided with a generous monthly stipend to cover my living and other necessary expenses. I was, therefore, free to indulge my tastes, whether it be artistic creation or procreation, with one of the society bar sluts that infest Manhattan like bedbugs. And fortunately, an annoying addendum in the Alden estate mandated that every legal adult member of our clan must return home for a family meeting called The Selection every quarter century. Failure to do so for any reason or excuse, save probable death, would result in being cut off from the family teat forever. Considering the unappealing alternative, I decided to return to the loving arms of my long-forsaken family for our precious little reunion. As I descended the cathedral stairs to the first floor, I could hear the nauseating sounds of family gossip and clinking dishes and silverware. Well, everyone, my grandfather, Bertram, announced, look who's decided to grace us with his presence. Seated around the table were twelve of my dearest family members, my grand-aunt Beatrice, who you already know by reputation, if not by name. Her broomstick lay in the far corner of the room as she huddled around the cup containing her smoking potion. Her face, perhaps, exhibited the best example of the pinched expression one makes when encountering an extremely malodorous smell. The rest of the Alden commune mirrored her look of disdain for my presence to greater or lesser degrees. My grandmother was seated across from my grandfather, who took up his familiar haunt at the table's head. In orders of pain in my ass, from greatest to least, 
were my twin sisters, Paula and Rachel, brother Trevor, my aunts Mary and Madeline, Uncle Daniel, two cousins I'll call Thing One and Thing Two, because I can't be bothered to recall their real idiotic names, and lastly, my favorite uncle, whom I hated least of all, Stephen. Good morning, Alden Cox and Twats, I said. I thought my greeting uh, very sunny for so early in the morning, but the shocked and disapproving looks I received from everyone, but a smirking Uncle Steve, seemed to indicate my cheeriness was not appreciated. Oh, well, fuck me for being perky in the early morning. It seemed everyone but Uncle Steve had finished their breakfast, or at least lost their appetite after seeing yours truly. They cleared out without another word, which was just fine with me. A servant served me some eggs and bacon with rye toast, as I gave a shit-eating grin across the table to my uncle. You still know how to make an entrance, don't you, you arrogant little shit? Steve said, It's a gift. I mumbled, stuffing my face with food. I think you can probably already tell why I like Uncle Steve, or at least why I despise him the least. He tells it like it is and doesn't pull any punches. Typically, the Alden family way is to smile in your face while holding a goddamn jagged dagger behind their backs. I think he also harbors a secret admiration for my go-screw-yourself-sideways attitude. I'd heard he'd been a real hellraiser and dickhead when he'd been my age. It takes one master to recognize another, I suppose. Well, I hope you don't lose that piss and vinegar you call a personality this afternoon. It's selection time, you know, Bramwell. And you've got the same one-thirteenth of a chance to spend a night in that room as anyone else. Uncle Steve rasped. At the mention of the room, the eggs swimming in my stomach juices decided to say screw it and bolt for the entrance. Only a quick save by my teeth and gums prevented my breakfast's escape. I forced the shits back down my chute with a gulp, leaving a sour taste behind. I'd heard rumors of some dark, weird shit going down in the room in the old abandoned West Wing. What's the worst they could do to me, though? Make me screw Grand Aunt Beatrice in some musty room all night? Have carnal knowledge of a donkey, like that show I saw in Tijuana, Mexico once. Whatever it is, it can't be worse than the hazing crap I went through to get into my college fraternity. I'd never before or since vomited up that large a quantity of cheap beer or engaged in as much ass play in my short life. See you this afternoon in the drawing room. It should be a fucking blast, Steve said, with that last sarcastic pronouncement hanging in the air like a sulfurous fart he took his leave. I pushed my half-eaten breakfast away. I wasn't hungry any longer. I watched my uncle as he left the breakfast room. If he wasn't careful, he might end up losing his place to thing two on my shit list. The Alden Thirteen lounged about the drawing room in a lazy, disjointed half-circle. Old Gramps stood by the mahogany mantel with a glass of brandy in his hand, in deep meditation or constipation. With my beloved grandfather Bertram, it was usually impossible to discover precisely which state he was experiencing at any one time. The rest of my relatives were imbibing in a variety of customized poisons from the well-stocked bar, except the evil witch of the Northeast. Uncle Daniel must have taken his A.A. sober chit for a heavily salted beer nut, because he was pounding back one single malt scotch after another, like the Highlands had given up distilling forever for Lent. 
Everyone pretended to be doing something other than staring at the glass bowl containing our thirteen names in the center of the room. You all know why you've assembled at the estate at this time. Gramps began. I usually call him Gramps or something similar in my head. Whenever I think of the old stick-up-his-ass fossil, because I know just how much he hated it when I called him such nicknames. He much preferred Grandfather Bertram, which, of course, is why I never called him Grandfather Bertram. Anywho, Gramps was far from finishing yakking yet. The ancient mummy always loved an audience, captive or otherwise. However, those who are new here today must be told the Alden family secret that binds us together in an eternal bond, Grampy said. He looked about the room with his geriatric gaze resting first on my bitch sisters, punk-ass brother, then things one and two, followed by your humble narrator. For some reason, his brandy must have been off-brand because his expression turned sour while looking at me over the top of his glass as he took a short sip. Jesus Christ, Dad! Uncle Daniel exclaimed. Let's get this damn thing over with. I think Uncle Dan might have been in a hurry because the bottle of scotch he'd been rapidly inhaling was running on empty. Perhaps we should arrange for a pure alcohol IV drip for you, Daniel. It might quiet your nerves and toughen your backbone, said old Grand Aunt Beatrice. Damn. Score one point for the land of Oz. Screw you, you old vicious... Bitch, said Dan. The drunk spire strikes back. Cue John Williams and the London Symphony Orchestra. That's quite enough, Daniel, said Grandmother. Uncle Daniel studied the insides of his empty glass. Please continue, Bertram. Thank you, my dear. In the late 17th century, our ancestor, Brutus Alden, had drunk gambled and hoard his way through the family fortune. All his business ventures had failed, and he was down to his last Spanish dollar. Desperate to avoid total ruin, he enlisted the help of a wise woman, or witch, to help him regain his wealth. With her help, a pact with the Prince of Darkness was made. The soul of Brutus would be surrendered upon death to the Prince of Evil, in exchange for a return to prosperity for himself and the Alden family forever. Unfortunately, upon his death, the devil appeared to his wife and told her that the soul of Brutus was too miserable a payment for the eternal prosperity it bestowed upon our family. He said that if the Alden bloodline wished to continue in its good fortune until the end of time, one adult member must be sacrificed every twenty-five years from that day forward by being locked in a particular room specially constructed for that singular purpose. And therein, an Alden has spent one entire night from dusk until dawn every generation, Gramps said. Holy shit, I howled. I mean, I knew there was some kind of mysterious punishment or torture or something, but I thought it was just some sick Alden sex or fantasy rush thing you had to do to keep the money tap flowing. The devil? What a bunch of prime grade A BS, I said. Shut up, Bramwell, Uncle Steve commanded. You don't know shit. I looked around in disbelief. The seniors in the room were all looking at the rug or their drinks. My two aunts whispered to each other in a conspiratorial tone. My loving sisters looked confused. My brother was stunned. And the things 
Uh, screw them. Who cares what the things thought? I assure you, Bramwell, I'm deadly serious, said Bertram. Every twenty-five years, an Alden has been chosen to spend a single night in the locked room upstairs in the abandoned west wing of the house. Every Alden released from that room in the morning has either been found dead of heart failure or hopelessly insane. No one knows what happens to those placed within. The dead can't talk and the insane won't talk. A moment of clarity hit me hard as a kick to the nuts, just as Gramps finished. Twenty-five years ago, I was born to a mother hopelessly insane. You bastards, I began. You put my mother, your own pregnant daughter, in that room twenty-five years ago, didn't you? Bramwell, you don't understand, said Grandpa Bertram. Bramwell, we had no choice, whispered Uncle Stephen. Her name was selected from the bowl. She refused to let anyone take her place, despite her condition. If I had a gun, I would have shot every one of those pieces of human garbage with my last name in that drawing room. Instead, I just collapsed into my chair and sobbed quietly into my hands. Grand Aunt Beatrice put her arm around me as I sat, crying. I was so messed up. I didn't even think to tell her to remove her desiccated, spindly appendage from my shoulders. It took about a half hour before I could finally seal the floodgates and stop blubbering like a baby. Gramps took that as a signal to start the next act of this family tragicomedy. He nodded to the servant at the drawing room doors. A minute later, two guys who looked like they'd graduated summa cum laude from Bouncer U entered the room, closing the double doors behind them. They wore the sleeveless wife-beater shirts that are part of the required club doorman uniform. Damn, I thought. Shit just got real. I'm afraid we must now move on to the selection, Gramps said. First, I will pull out each identical piece of paper and lay it down on the table to confirm that each of our names have been prepared. One after another, Bertram read off our thirteen names neatly printed on each piece of paper. Brother Trevor studied each slip as if he was looking for some mark, folded corner, or code that might reveal a fixed game. Having been thrown out of Las Vegas and Atlantic City for cheating, I figured he was probably the best man for the job. The twins and the things watched Trevor in awe like he was Indiana Jones studying the Ark of the Covenant. When he got to my name, I couldn't help but start involuntarily, and I wasn't the only jumpy Alden in that room. Only Uncle Daniel was too anesthetized to react to his moniker's announcement, and the wicked Beatrice was too aloof to give us the satisfaction of seeing her ancient bones startle. Once done, he spilled all the names back into the clear glass bowl. A lid was placed on top, and old Bertram shook that glass container roughly, like it owed him some money and wouldn't pay up. Gramps looked at the two gorillas in our midst and beckoned one of them forward. Sir, I will require your assistance. I will remove the top of this bowl. I need you to turn around away from the container. When I say I want you to reach your left arm behind you and quickly select just one slip of paper, do you understand? Gramps asked. The gorilla scrunched up its face to indicate its comprehension and turned away from Gramps and the bowl of fate. I felt like I was an audience member in a movie theater 
where they finally get to the point where the explosion happens and everything goes into slow motion as the heroes flee the growing blast just behind them. When my name was called out by the bouncer, I think I left my body, floating above near the ceiling, laughing at the unlucky asshole below. Until I fell back to earth and realized I was that asshole. Okay, I guess it's me then, I stammered. It was a half-assed plan that instantly formed in my brain went like this. I make like I'm going willingly, all resigned-like. Then I sucker-punched the bouncer, who fingered the bowl and watched him fall like a ton of shit to the floor. Then I hit the last lurking gorilla with that kung fu spinning kick move I sort of learned during that summer after eighth grade when I took classes at the dojo in the strip mall. Bouncer, too, would then collapse with a broken neck or something. Lastly, a quickly improvised, clever catchphrase would cap off the whole shebang as I exited Alden Manor like James fucking Bond. Yeah, as the truly perceptive folks among my readers have already guessed, uh, my plan fell short somewhat but only in the sense that my sneaky ninja attack on the first bouncer was deflected courtesy of his superhuman-like reflexes, and I was slightly knocked out by his subsequent counterattack. I came to as I was being unceremoniously carried by both bouncers, who held my arms and legs. From my unique vantage point, I could see the cobwebs everywhere in appealing wall molding, I began to plead and beg as best I could, with the sledgehammer pounding in the side of my head, while my mouth and brain were making words uh, not good. I'd like to say I wasn't scared, despite the severity of the predicament, but I think the trail of piss behind me revealed my clever ruse to my bulky captors. The bouncer holding my legs seemed to be the most pissed, both figuratively and quite literally. We stopped at an oak door that looked old and weathered, but solid and sturdy nonetheless. There was a series of ten locks in the door. Some were quite antique, while others appeared quite new with shiny brass fittings. Old Gramps had a large circular keychain like the jailers in those 1930s and 40s movies used to have. The keys he used to unlock each bolt were as different as the locks themselves. Sorry I have to do this, Bramwell. Gramps said, Eat me, you old dick. I hope you burn in hell for this, I said. I was tossed inside the room none too gently. From my newest vantage point, lying in a heap upon the floor, I noticed that neither of the three men who had escorted me to my place of execution had even set one toe past the entrance into the room. The last thing I saw as the ponderous door closed was the stony face of Grampy Bertram. Instantly, the locks clicked one by one. I tried pounding on the door and drop-kicked it twice, before I realized the thing had the consistency of poured concrete. I wasn't getting out of here that way for sure. I took the flashlight the Good Samaritans had left me and surveyed the room, searching for any imperfection I might capitalize on to escape. I found nothing obvious. What I did find was a room devoid of any furnishings, windows, or wall hangings of any kind. The whole room was a masterpiece of understatement, like Jackie Mason said once in the movie, The Jerk. The walls were painted white, but sometimes, when the flashlight hit them at an oblique angle, they looked multicolored or prismatic. The overall workmanship was for shit, though. One wall had a twelve-foot ceiling, while the others had smaller, irregular heights. I had to gradually hunch down before I could even touch the far wall. 
I surmise that whoever built this room must have done so after a long lunch at the local bar. Eventually, I grew tired and sat down. How long had I been in this room? It was hard to say. It may have been my growing terror messing with my sense of time and space, but I suddenly had the feeling like I'd always been here in this room, and always would be. The walls slowly began to glow now as I stared at them, moving, pulsating, dilating, and contracting like a mother preparing to give birth. My fear ebbed as I felt something melding with the room in some sort of odd symbiosis. I could no longer tell where the walls ended and I began anymore. Hell, even the question itself became absurd and irrelevant to me. A chaotic scene of color, shape, and sound assaulted my new senses. I saw my ancestor, Brutus Alden, making a deal with the devil. No, I was Brutus, and I was making the deal. I felt his animal fear as he stood before the fallen angel, and I experienced his joy as all his business dealings brought the family untold riches. I saw his slave ships with their fitted holds and suffering human cargo. I knew his whorehouses intimately, where he forced his girls to perform all manner of sick and perverted acts to his high-paying customers. I witnessed every cheat, theft, lie, and finally murder that Brutus committed to grow his fortune under his satanic magical shield. I even beheld his death in this very room, as he coughed out his life from consumption as an old man. Shit, I felt his death. It was my lungs that were failing, my life force ebbing while the ever-present pain sapped my strength and will to live. This last experience was just too much, too damn real. Oh, the agony as I struggled to steal one last breath from the earth before I died. The pain was over now. I, or was it Brutus, that was dead? I wasn't sure anymore. All I cared about, as we both, Brutus and Bramwell Inc., floated by our body, was that the suffering was finally over. At that moment, a loud crack echoed throughout the room as deed owner to the soul of Brutus Alden slowly took shape as an amorphous shadow in the corner of the room. As the hella shade spoke, the words emerged as if from the bottom of a deep well. This is the pathetic soul for which I granted an eternity of wealth and good fortune? The Dark Lord said, I have been cheated for the last time by you loathsome apes. Henceforth, one member in every generation of your family will suffer in this room I shall mold and desecrate to properly compensate me for my boundless generosity. The walls of the room began to take on a fluidic consistency. Weird, unearthly colors, sounds filled the ruined room. Angels, foreign to our earthly reality, took form only to melt away into new shapes as chaos seized command of this once simple room. The demonic shade now surveyed Brutus and raised the obscenities that were his arms. Gradually, I began to hear the chattering sounds of a million insects whirring within the room. The sound grew in intensity until it reached the decibels that only a large jet can approach. Growing out of the floor, like a cancerous mole, was a portal tearing a hole into our dimension. I held my hands, 
over my bleeding ears, vainly trying to block out the demonic din assaulting my sanity. Just when I thought I could bear it no longer, a host of cockroach-like humanoids swarmed out of this stable chasm. Their bodies were armored in brown and black chitin, and they skittered about on six legs. They were six feet long with faces, if those abominations could be called that, twisted into demonic leers with mouths filled with fangs like daggers. The creature's eyes, however, resembled those of humans who had abandoned all hope of any release from eternal pain and unnatural bondage. The devilish servant seized the shrunken soul of my ancestor and dragged him down into the pit as he frantically struggled to avoid his loathsome fate. The Prince of Lies vanished from the room as the agonized wails of Brutus faded away into the ever-shrinking abyss. I now understood, fully understood, the genesis and reason for the Alden family curse. I quaked in fear, hoping against hope that the worst was now over. However, once more the images reappeared. Only now I was each and every slave in those dark slave galleys. I experienced each and every second, minute, hour, and eternity of their pain and anguish. I bled and died, forgotten in a rotting wooden ship, my emancipated body dumped into the ocean like a piece of worthless flotsam. I was every mistreated whore beaten, strangled, scourged, and dying from syphilis that had contributed to the Alden treasure trove. I was the dying children, starving because their father was paid poor wages by the family fisheries and shipyards, joining the ever-growing legion of the damned tearing my soul asunder was every Alden relative who spent a night in this hellish room. Lastly, I was my pregnant mother losing her sanity in this very room under the same cacophony of excruciating pain and mental anguish that was now drowning me under relentless, crushing, suffocating waves. I felt myself sinking lower and lower into the benighted depths. I prayed for the blessing of death with my last rational thought, but alas, my heart was too strong to know when to quit. My mind, however, knew just when it was time to throw in the towel. I'm in the dream again. You know, the one where I can't move because I'm trapped at the beginning of the story? The walls here, I'm told, are white also. But their workmanship is of much higher quality, with a uniform height across the entire ceiling. I confirm this level fact every day during my exercise, pacing back and forth time. I like this dream room much more than the bad room. Sometimes I try to tell people about the crooked room, but although the thoughts are clear in my mind, the words always come out as high-pitched squeals and whines, punctuated with half-strangled groans. I usually give up trying after a few minutes. Anyway, this dream is infinitely superior, as I sometimes have the company of deep-voiced men and gentle women. If I've been good and hadn't made a loud fuss that day, they sometimes read to me. I used to love to read whenever TV sucked. But it's a little difficult now, because whenever they unstrap my jacket during examination time, my eye sockets feel empty and all hollowed out. I hope you enjoyed The Crooked Room by author Rick Pyle as performed by yours truly. 
Up next, we've got another terrifying tale, this one courtesy of author Simon Nagel. In it, we'll meet Madeline and Alan, two strangers destined to spend more time getting to know one another than they had ever imagined. Unfortunately for them, it's bound to be under less than ideal circumstances. <laughs> Without further ado, I present to you, Diving Bell. The goldfish bobbed up and down at Madeline, occasionally turning to peer at the city through its cellophane bag as she took it home. The wind kicked up dust and debris from the gutters into Madeline's eyes, and her back ached from hauling her mother's hefty tote over her shoulder. She was thankful this was the last load. She counted her steps as she trudged to her building, and when that got tedious, she focused on taking deep breaths. Her sweat felt good against the cold night air, and it took her mind off how heavy her eyes felt. Madeline cursed herself for never getting off her ass to pay the building manager an extra fifty bucks for a real parking spot. She reached the stoop and realized that she didn't have anything to put the fish in once she got inside her apartment. It made her mad at Peter all over again for taking Mom's nice things and stiffing her with an old lady's clothes and a carnival goldfish that had somehow kept living beyond all expectations. She dumped the tote beside the rest and caught her breath, Getting everything in the elevator was going to be just as shitty. She made eye contact with the fish and pictured it surviving nuclear winter in the plastic salad bowl she was going to have to keep it in until she could find something better. Of course, Mom died and the fish lived. Madeline had just finished stacking the totes beside the elevator when Peter called and all she could think of was the stupid frown on his face that morning when she showed up wearing her ratty Kill Bono t-shirt. He was just as shirt with her on her phone as he had been all throughout the day, and just as he was beginning his bullshit plea for her to come back over to Mom's to move more boxes, Madeline's phone died. Her forehead burnt up as she rummaged through her purse for Redeem cards. What kind of adult uses a pay-as-you-go phone? She thought as she tossed her spent time cards to the floor and huffed outside to the payphone. Peter's number was the only one Madeline still remembered by heart. She looked up to her old building, waiting for him to answer her collect call. No one was outside, and Madeline wondered about the bygone era when the neighborhood looked new and when all of it began to decay. Peter answered by resuming where he left off. Why won't you come back and help me? Madeline stopped herself from telling him that she had already busted her ass all day and just wanted to go home. She stopped herself from saying that she had never wanted to go to Mom's in the first place. She even stopped herself from joking about the Ebola she was probably getting from handling the greasy payphone. She was avoiding everything that she wanted to say until she realized the line was quiet and Peter was waiting for her to say something. I can't move any more boxes tonight. I got to get this fish in a bowl. I can use tap water, right? Peter began hemming and hawing about her duties as a daughter, but she didn't wait for him to finish this time. This is why you should have taken Mom's stupid fish, Peter. She forced out before hanging up. Madeline entered her building, wondering if she should just put the fish on Craigslist. People do that, right? Her thoughts were cut off by a man waiting by the elevator. He was smiling at her, holding one of her spent redeem cards in his hand, like it was a ticket for her entry onto the elevator. Y you dropped this, he said. Madeline took the card out of politeness. 
The man kept smiling at her, expecting more from her. His Sears business suit matched the fake wood floors of the building. Thanks. She wished the elevator would come. Any time, said the man. He was around her age, maybe older. He seemed like the type that always came off older than he really was. Madeline wondered if he had been watching her, straining to move the totes to the elevator by herself, but thought he'd be a real help by picking up her useless card. She focused on the dim glow of the elevator button, occasionally feeling him stealing glances at her, with that dopey-pursed smile stuck to his face to signal that he was friendly. You didn't wait around here to give me that card, did you? She asked. The elevator's been taking a while, he said. He smiled again, and the elevator mercifully arrived. Well, it looks like I got a case of the spoke too soons. He laughed, hoping that she would laugh with him. It took Madeline several minutes to get all of the totes into the elevator. It was a cramped compartment for a time of yore, when elevators had operators in uniform that politely pushed buttons to take you to your floor. It featured two sets of doors, which she had constantly kept wedged open to move everything inside. The man didn't help at all, but he managed to stand too close to Madeline once she hit the button for the 43rd floor. Madeline kept her eyes on the panel, watching the floors slowly creak by on the way to the top of the building. She held the goldfish in her arms and wondered if she needed to go out and get it food, or if it could just wait until morning. Dun-dun! The man sang, imitating the theme from Jaws. Madeline heard him, but for the sake of his dignity, pretended it never happened. Dun-dun! He chimed again. She faced him with the most discouraging look she could muster. He grinned and motioned to her goldfish. King of the sea, he said. It's fresh water, said Madeline. What's his name? Granted that it's a he. You can't really see underneath his fins there. Oops, there you go. It's fins. Helen, said Madeline. Oh, that's lovely, he said, happy that she was engaging with him. What made you name her Helen? After Helen Keller, you know, the mute girl? The man, not nearly as thick as she thought, raised his eyebrows and laughed. Well, that's the best go fuck yourself I've heard in a while, he said. And yet you're still talking, said Madeline. If I come across something that deserves a complaint, I give one. I'm sorry, it's just the way I am. I'm Alan, by the way. Alan repositioned himself and smiled. What's your name? He realized his error and said, Helen, at the same time as Madeline. He pointed to her and chuckled to let her know that she got him. Madeline was in awe of Alan's presence and wondered where she would be in her life with such bullheadedness. The elevator stopped and she felt a twinge of relief except no one was there to save her from Alan, when the doors opened to an empty hallway. The doors closed on Madeline's hope for another passenger, but not before she noticed a strange dampness on the floor's threshold. The building was old. Pipes leaked all the time, but something felt odd. Something was unsettled the whole day and carried on into the starless night. The world felt like it wasn't occupied by anyone but people like Alan and her brother. Like all the good people had gone, like her mother. Really, though, what's your name? asked Alan. Madeline. There, that wasn't so bad, was it? he said. Madeline sighed and told him that she had a long day and really just wanted to get the fish in a bowl and go to sleep. You know what the best parts are about... Long days, he asked, that they end. Alan looked proud of his wit. Madeline looked dour. It's not like anyone died or anything, he said. 
Madeline still didn't respond, so Alan dug deeper. She was deaf and blind, too? What? Helen Keller. She was blind, deaf, and mute. My mom died. Alan's face blanched, and he tried to apologize, even though he wasn't quite sure for what. I was cleaning her house today. Madeline went on. I, because she died. Alan tried explaining that it was impossible for him to know that, only to get steamrolled by Madeline's contempt for her mother's goldfish being forced upon her. The exchange ended with Alan bursting into a breathless stream of apologies until the elevator groaned. They both stopped and listened, cocking their heads at the groaning of the machinery. The elevator clunked onward and whined with every passing foot. We've been moving for a while, right? Madeline asked. It was then that she noticed they were only on the 14th floor. The elevator should have already taken them to the top. Alan stared at the floor counter. The playfulness drained from his face as the counter crept past 15. The gears whined at 16. Madeline looked away from the floor counter hoping it would change how off everything felt. She focused on Helen, the goldfish, and thought of those long childhood nights gazing at her fish tank from her bed. It had a nightlight built into it and made a horrible hum that woke her up most nights, but the fish's shadows dancing along the walls made everything feel like it would be all right. Helen made a simple glug with her mouth that seemed to know what Madeline was thinking all too well before the cables above the elevator snapped. The compartment lurched, and it fell down the shaft. Madeline and Alan screamed as the feeling of weightlessness overcame the compartment. The sudden pressure beneath them gave way, and their feet lifted into the air. Madeline gripped the elevator's railing as best she could, but her body felt like it was being pulled apart. She clung tightly to the fish bag as its water rose to the top. She had a sudden burst of memory from her youth about the swinging pirate ship ride at the county fair. Peter, taking her all the way to the back, telling her she'd be fine. He was older. She trusted him. They sat at the end seats, her chin just above the safety rail. With every swing of the ship, she would lift higher out of her seat. Peter did his best to hold her, but she remembered crying and looking desperately to the ground for her mother. She could get the carney to stop the ride and save her. Her mother was nowhere to be found, and the ship swung higher. Madeline closed her eyes, but nothing took away the image of the ground at the fair littered with cups and spent tickets blurring by as she hurtled into the sky. They had fallen twenty feet when the compartment came to a sudden stop. There was no twisting of metal, no screeching of gears, or a scraping of the walls against the sides of the shaft. Madeline's legs absorbed the impact, and the railing kept her from toppling over. Alan bumped off the wall and got his bearings. What in the world just happened? He asked as he pressed the button for the doors to open. He pressed several times. The clicking of the button sounded worse than the creaks of the elevator. Madeline felt her teeth grate together. Press it again. It might work this time, she said. Alan turned his face red. You got any more great suggestions? Why don't we try getting out and pushing? Madeline felt like she could be taking it a little easier on Alan, but she couldn't stop herself. It made the situation more tolerable. We could be in here for hours. I don't want to be in here for hours, do you? Your fish could die, he said. Oh, that would be great. That's right, you hate fish, Alan muttered to himself as he tore open the elevator's call box. Is there a number or something I have to hit first for this to work? I don't think so. 
Alan tried using the call box almost as many times as he hit the button for the doors. The line was dead. He pulled out his cell phone. Let's see if anything's going on with building management. He dialed and waited. Madeline listened closely to the ringing. Alan looked at her vacantly. It's busy. He ended the call and dialed 911. Bringing in the National Guard? She tried it. Alan listened and snorted through his nose, determined not to let Madeline get under his skin. Maybe we just wait and try not to panic, she suggested. He looked to the scratched linoleum floor on the elevator and pressed the phone tight to his ear, as if more pressure would change the outcome. 911 picks up right away, right? Alan knew the answer, but wanted to hear something different. He held the phone out to her. The ring was the only sound in the elevator. Maybe it was an earthquake, all that shaking we felt back there. We got knocked off the elevator track or something. Maybe that's why the phone's busy. Because there was a lot of damage. Looks like we sit tight then, said Madeline. The shaft groaned again, squealing in agony. She thought for a moment and batted her eyes his way. Know any good ghost stories? Don't count on it. It seems like this was what you wanted, face time in the elevator. Madeline felt like a kid poking a beehive. I told you I didn't hold the elevator. Alan took off his jacket. He spread his legs apart and thrust his hands into the seam between the doors. His body quivered as he tried to pry them apart. It was a sad sight to behold. Alan, come on, I'm sorry. I'm not going to get trapped in here while you cut my dick off all night, he said through clenched teeth. Madeline had poked the hive too many times and now the bees were frightened and confused. There was no honey to be had here. Look, I'll back off, she said. Just be safe, okay? Don't worry, sweetheart, I got it. She could tell he loved saying that. If her stomach wasn't already upside down, it would have made her feel gross. It was the same way Peter told her that she'd be fine on the carnival ride. The same way he told her He'd take care of everything when Mom died. The doors gave way slightly. A little crack showed, but there was no light. Alan looked back with a satisfied smile. Impressed? Well, a little. She had to give him that much. That's the Bowflex coming through. He resumed prying before he could see Madeline's raised eyebrows. Use it every morning, twice on weekends. He stretched out twice when he said it. Great! I'm trapped in an elevator with an infomercial from the 1990s. Giving him shit was the only thing that kept away a creeping feeling that nothing was going to be okay. You jest, but... Alan trailed off as he made one last valiant tug. He erupted with a warrior cry to throw the doors open with his remaining strength but the doors wouldn't budge. Alan fell to the floor, panting in defeat. It looks like the power of the bow let us down. It was worth a shot, Alan said between breaths. Madeline felt a raising anger. Now what happens when you need that energy if something else comes up? You spend it all on bullshit. She thought of the countless totes and boxes She'd hauled around that day. They made her run palms red. The metal creaked from the outside. Something was giving way again. The creaking spread from one end of the elevator to the other. Madeline wondered if the thing was going to crack in half. The top was probably still attached to some of the cables, but the elevator had taken such a beating that it couldn't hold together any longer. The creaking moved down the side of the compartment near the doors, but then Madeline heard it behind her as well. She didn't see any cracks in the walls. The sound then traveled all the way down to the floor, and she felt it vibrating beneath her feet. 
She listened closer, trying to hear past her own heavy breathing. Her chest tightened, and her core felt empty. It wasn't a creaking sound. It was scratching. Do you feel that? What the hell is it? Alan's eyes were glued to the floor. The scratches had traipsed down the panels and migrated to the floor until they were all underneath them. Alan shuffled to the corner of the elevator, and the scratching moved away from him. It was all beneath Madeline. The vibrations ran up her legs, and she started to quiver. The scratching intensified. It wasn't scraping against the outside. It was trying to penetrate the floor. Madeline couldn't understand what it was, but deep in the place where all our instincts lie, she knew this was true. Very slowly, Madeline laid down her bags. She left Helen on the floor and reached for the elevator railing. She gripped it tightly and lifted herself off the floor, pressing up with her legs tucked. Alan quickly copied her, and the scratching dispersed. It was trying to find them. The two looked to each other, unable to say anything. All they could do was share the same terrified stare. The scratching moved back to Madeline's bags, and soon it was all beneath the goldfish. Then it all went away for a moment, lowering back down into the shaft. Before either of them could find any words for what had just happened, the elevator jolted as a gigantic force thrust into it from below. The floor shook and the bags all lifted off the ground. Alan and Madeline got rocked from their perches on the reeling. Alan spilled to the floor and screamed while Madeline managed to hang on. They got pounded again, and the metal moaned. Madeline's arms were warm and shaking. She couldn't control her breathing. She dreaded that the floor might give way if she fell, and then she and Alan would fall twenty stories down the shaft. The pounding stopped. Madeline lowered herself to the floor. Her arms were on fire, and she couldn't hoist herself any longer. She picked up the goldfish. It frantically zipped to and fro in the bag, but slowed to a calming pace when Madeline held it close. Alan wiped blood from his nose. He didn't clean off his hand when Madeline offered him help from the floor. She leaned against the wall and caught her breath. It's like it, he trailed off. It? she asked. They knowingly didn't waste time with doubt. Something was out there. It's like it wanted the fish. Alan couldn't take his eyes off the little goldfish. Madeline wondered if he was using it as an example to stare at his chest. But Alan looked serious. It wanted me, too, Madeline added. She didn't like Alan's eyes. She couldn't tell what was behind them. But it was gunning for the fish. All that scratching beneath it? I think that's what it was after. Whatever it is, I think it's too big to give a shit about a little carnival goldfish. Madeline thought of Peter trying to hold her steady on the pirate ride again. His hand weakly pressed against her shoulder. It took her years to realize that it wouldn't have saved her if anything had happened. She still felt his clammy palm through her shirt. Did the fish's bag break? Madeline focused and felt the bag. Shit! I thought you hated it, Alan said. The voice was distant. Yeah, but she couldn't find any holes. She was about to tell Alan the bag was fine, but she was cut off by a loud plop. Something had fallen from the ceiling. The floor was wet, and there was a dank smell in the air. Maybe the pipes are busted, he said. Another droplet fell from the ceiling and hit Alan's shoulder. It was oily, thicker than water. It oozed down Alan's shirt. Madeline felt her shoulder. The same stuff had crept down the wall on her side and dribbled onto her. She then saw the thing through the casing of the elevator's fluorescent lights. 
It slithered along the light duct, pulling itself along and flopping forward as it groped its way along the compartment. With every flop, the watery slop that coated it sputtered down onto them. At first, Madeline thought it was some kind of worm. If she was trying to be rational, she might have reasoned that it was someone's pet snake that had escaped and grown quite large living in the nooks and crannies of the building. But she couldn't think of it as anything other than a flabby tentacle. It had writhed into the compartment from the roof and was now feeling its way inside, searching. It had jagged needles along its stomach, that was what had been scratching beneath the floor. Madeline froze. Her heart pounded in her chest, and the idea of any movement at all felt like it would give herself away and the tentacle would collapse down on top of her. Even so, Madeline had felt no way of stopping herself from rasping. What the fuck is that? Alan was shaking uncontrollably. He returned to his corner and hoisted himself up on the railing again, but the goo from the tentacle had seeped onto it. His hand slipped over the rail and he toppled onto the floor. The tentacle stopped. Alan looked up, waiting for the worst, but it never came. The tentacle receded through the duct and made a wet sucking sound as it slid through the hole it came from. Alan shushed Madeline when she tried asking if he was all right. I don't think keeping our voices down is going to make much of a difference, she said. It went away when we got quiet. We don't even know what it is. Madeline knew this was true, but that same unsettled spot inside of her was whispering that it didn't matter one bit. Alan pulled himself off the floor and spoke with the conviction of a man converting on his deathbed. I was watching a nature show this one time. They put a dead fish in a bottle and corked it. Then they put the bottle in a tank with an octopus. And in less than five minutes, the octopus felt around the bottle, sucked the cork out, and ate the fish. Alan pointed down at Helen. It glugged at him. It wants the fish, he said. Madeline tensed. He was serious. Take it easy, she said in her most calming voice. It was the same one that Mom would use when in the aquarium nightlight wasn't enough. No, it wants the fish. That's what octopuses eat, don't they? We'll just open the door, toss at the fish, and be on our way. I don't think opening the door is a good idea, Alan. Well, what do we do then? Alan snapped. His face seemed to elongate as he raved on. You know when everything is a bad idea, so what's a good idea? Oh, wait, that involves having to do something. Then maybe you'd actually have to take responsibility. Maybe my ideas are good and yours are bad. You ever thought about that? Oh, no, of course not. I forgot. That would mean you actually considered being wrong. Look at how well that's working for you. Trapped in an elevator with your stupid goldfish waiting for someone to do the work for you. I'm sure you'll find a way to complain about however you get saved. At this point, Madeline knew that there was nothing she could say to calm Alan down. And there was just as much danger inside the elevator as whatever was lurking outside. This wasn't harmless like the thought of poking a beehive. Fear had overtaken Alan. There would be no more reason left in him. She did her best to look calm while sizing him up. He had proven to be strong with the door, and she was exhausted. I'm sorry, Alan. Go ahead. Open the door. His grim demeanor gave way to the same sappy smile, which looked even more awful on his haggard face. That's more like it. He had a bounce in his step as he turned to the elevator doors. He shoved his hands into the small gap and pushed outward. His muscles shone through his wet shirt. Madeline watched closely as Alan pried with more resolve. 
He wasn't trying to impress her anymore. Maybe he's just trying to survive now, she thought. Madeline couldn't tell if she was lying to herself. She even felt a bit relieved as the doors started to budge. Maybe she's just negative, like Peter told her all morning. It didn't have to be this way, you know, grunted Alan. I was going to take you to the chart house. He wasn't looking over his shoulder to talk to her like last time. Madeline's jaw hardened. Just open the doors, Alan. A part of me was thinking, just take the stairs instead of waiting for the elevator. Get some cardio. But no. The doors were six inches apart now. I saw your tits underneath your Kill Bono shirt and thought, I'd try to get lucky. By the way, a t-shirt on a cold night? Not the best way to repel a man's attention. Your tits practically bore holes through it. Madeline backed up. There was nowhere to go. Her hand slipped against the slime on the railing. She nervously sifted her fingers through it. Alan's body shook as the doors gave way. He finally looked over his shoulder. His eyebrows were raised with an insincere look of friendliness. Got the fish? I'm not giving you Helen. I thought we went over this already. He stepped toward her with his hand out. He kept one hand on the door to keep it open. This is my fish now. I have to take care of it. Alan's grasp stretched out to Madeline. His fingers twitched as he tried to extend them even further toward her. He kept his voice low, like a man trying to lure a child out of hiding. Come on, he insisted. We just have to give it something. His fingertips passed over the fish's bag. Madeline pressed her back to the wall as Alan's hand moved past Helen and hovered over her wrist. The doors grated as the metal screeched apart. To tide it over while we get out. The doors to the elevator tore open. Alan winced and got whipped to the wall by a gust of balmy spray. Madeline balked at the musty smell and wiped her eyes. She was the first to see it. A large, hideous eye, the size of a hubcap, stared back at her. Its bulk took up the entire doorway. It had a pink hue from never seeing daylight. Thick, translucent veins wove around its body. The eye pulsed back and forth between her and Alan, not so much moving as it was like jelly quivering in a bowl. It shifted itself, rubbing against the compartment and crushing it like a cheap beer can. Alan balked, frozen by fear and the inability to comprehend the beast's immensity. His hand reached over to Madeline, but he was unable to keep his eyes off it. Madeline saw Alan's hand coming at her in the same slow, deliberate way that the creature had tried to reach into the elevator with its tentacles, but she couldn't move either. As the beast repositioned its body, she caught the first sight of its horrible beak, revealing itself under a flap of pasty skin. She thought of the way Mom's mouth had sputtered right before she passed, and how she laid there on her pillow with the same look, but had somehow looked peaceful in death. She remembered how Mom had told her that she had never wanted Peter to take care of anything when she was gone. How had he gone against her final wishes? How long she had held Madeline with tears in her eyes after she got pulled from the pirate ship. Madeline took the ooze that had dripped onto the elevator's railing and slathered it all over her hands and reached out to Alan. He grabbed on and pulled like she knew he would, hoping to slingshot her into the beast to create an opening for himself to escape. Alan's eyes widened and twitched back and forth, just like the creature's had, when he felt the slime on Madeline's arm. She watched him slip away from her, his face contorting in shock and rage. He tried to hold tighter, 
but her arm was too greased, and his body was weak from opening the doors. His nails scratched her skin as he dug deeper, but by then it was too late, and Alan's own force sent him stumbling into the black, gaping beak. The rest happened too quickly for Madeline to really see. The beak clamped down, and just like how she had been covered in the balmy water when the creature had burst into the compartment, Madeline was now covered in a spray of Alan's blood and viscera. She tried to wipe off quickly to get Alan out of her eyes, but it was thick. The crackling of his bones drowned out the screams as he was devoured. It's feeding complete. The beast lowered itself away and all was quiet. Madeline stood deathly still, listening to the sounds of the building. She flinched at a few distant clicking sounds, but soon a wave of them came through the halls of the floor they had stopped on and the power came on. The girl from Impanema played through the remaining elevator speaker, and Madeline dropped to her knees, gagging. It only took her a minute or two to keep up between the two floors the elevator was stuck between. Madeline took Helen, but left the totes. She cradled the bag in her arms as she shuffled down the hall and up through the stairway. If she listened closely, she could hear a few sifting sounds through the thin apartment walls as she passed by. Every once in a while, a groan came from somewhere else in the building, but Madeline saw nothing on the way up to her apartment. Whatever had been deep within the walls had submerged itself once again. The blood had started to dry on her skin as she unlocked her door. Madeline lifted Helen up to her face before she went inside. She wanted to understand what had happened. She wanted to not have to talk to anyone. She wanted to go into her apartment and never come out again, ever. She wanted to say something that would make all of this be all right somehow, but remembered that no matter what she did, she would have to clean the bowl she was planning on keeping the damn fish in before she could go to sleep. I really hope you don't mind tap water. Helen glugged back at her. It would be okay. I hope you enjoyed Diving Bell by author Simon Nagel, as performed by yours truly. I'd like to personally thank you for joining me for this episode of Scary Stories Told in the Dark. If you enjoyed what you've heard, please take a moment to stop by our iTunes page, or wherever else you listen to your favorite podcast, and leave us a five-star review and a kind word. It makes a huge difference and would mean a lot to if you'd like to hear a premium extended edition of tonight's and all of our other episodes featuring twice the terror, visit simplyscarypodcast.com today and click the patrons link in the menu at the top of the screen. You'll find yourself at chillingtalesfordarknights.com where you can purchase a season's pass for this podcast and our other quality storytelling programs or become a patron for as little as $5 per month and get access to our entire audio archive dating back to 2012, all of it ad-free. If you happen to use Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, or YouTube, you can follow and subscribe to Chilling Tales for Dark Nights there, where you'll get all of our latest updates and new releases and have the chance to interact with us each and every week. You can subscribe to me on YouTube as well, at the Otis Jiry channel, where you'll find releases of my series, Horror Storytime, dating back to 2014. And you can find me on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram too. Just search for Otis Jiry. Until next week, stay spooky and get some sleep. If you can. <laughs>
Thanks for listening. You've been listening to Scary Stories Told in the Dark, a production of Chilling Entertainment and the creative team at Chilling Tales for Dark Nights, and a proud member of the Simply Scary Podcasts Network. Visit simplyscarypodcast.com today to learn more about our network and our other amazing storytelling programs. Tonight's program was hosted and its featured stories performed by yours truly, Otis Jiry. Selected stories have been adapted with the kind permission of their respective authors. Original music provided by Luke Hodgkinson and Jesse Cornett. Sound design and final mixing and mastering provided by executive producer and director Craig Groshek. Program's artwork and logo by David Romero. If you're looking for some fresh tales on a daily basis while waiting for the next podcast, check out my YouTube channel, The Otis Jiry Channel, and my extensive collection of narrated tales there. Simply search on YouTube by my name and you'll find me. And don't forget to subscribe and press the bell notification icon to get my latest releases. Got a scary tale of your own that you'd like performed? I take submissions. Email it to me today at Otis at simplyscarypodcast.com to have your terrifying tome considered for production in a future episode of this show. That's O-T-I-S at simplyscarypodcast.com. If you've enjoyed what you heard on tonight's program and are joining us on your favorite podcast app, subscribe to us to be sure you never miss an episode and leave a five-star review and a comment. Your feedback means a lot to me. You can also follow Chilling Tales for Dark Nights and yours truly on Facebook to connect anytime and get the latest updates on this and other programs and my channel. If you're listening on the Chilling Tales for Dark Nights YouTube channel, do us a favor and hit the subscribe button and the bell notification icon for CTFDN as well to get more spooky tales from me and the crew and another episode of this program each and every Wednesday. And don't forget to hit that thumbs up button to tell us how we're doing and leave a kind word or a request. And don't forget to visit us at ChillingTalesForDarkNights.com and consider supporting the team by becoming a patron. In addition to helping us out, you'll get exclusive access to our audio archive and ad-free downloads of all your favorite stories, including those you've heard on this program. As for me, I'll be back next Wednesday with more terrifying tales to keep you up all night. But that's all right. Who needs sleep anyway? (laughs) Chilling Tales for Dark Nights.